for page six. Okay, gentlemen. So let's, I would, even though we are on page 118, um, but since on a good week, from week to week, we have no clue what we did the week before. Um, I think this would be, uh, uh, it, with your indulgence, if we could go back to page 115, 115, um, because it just, we don't want to start in the middle of this uh, chapter. Okay? So we're going to go back to 115. Um, the level of God's perfection that acts within the world. Okay. Student. So comes along our student. I still need some clarification with regard to the attribute of God's sovereignty that you mentioned, which is sovereignty means God's unity, oneness, um, I don't fully understand how this attribute can be an aspect of God's simple perfection. Now, what he's referring to is that God's going to share something with us about himself, and that's really going to be, that's our, the pleasure that he wished to bestow upon, a, upon another. Um, seemingly, it cannot be part of his perfection, since you have already said that his true perfection is ungrasp ungraspable uh, and totally beyond this world. So what do you mean God's going to share with us something if we can't know God at all? It's a decent question, says the rabbi, says the seichel. You have asked a good question. Let me help you understand this matter correctly. Yes, it is impossible to grasp God's simple perfection in any way at all, since his simple perf perfection is his true perfection, which is totally unknowable and elevated beyond anything related to the created world. Right? Back to the professor teaching the 10th grade, right? Um, the 10th grade has its capabilities, and but, you know, you're never truly going to know the what the, what the professor knows and, and relate to that, but to something of it. Let's see. As soon as God decided to create and direct the world, he defined and willed these specific attributes which relate only to the limited level of the created world. Um, they do not relate to his true level at all. Therefore, his simple essence is completely removed from anything related to these attributes. So that strengthens the question really it just it, it it says yes good 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 point um however furthermore even those attributes of action that exist according to the level of the created world were not made as he could have made them so it's almost like Okay, here we have the, you know, Einstein teaching a 10th grade physics class. Um, okay, we understand we're not going to get all of Einstein, but it's not even a good class. Like he's fumbling. He's, he's like, it's not even, hang on a second, you're Einstein. Like at least for 10th grade, get it clear. Hi, Jason. Um, so um, thanks, Gil. Um, so furthermore, even the attributes of, so meaning, of course, it's a created world and it's not according to God's perfection, but even the created world is messed up, right? If I would, I was trying to write the, the points of, of theme throughout this book. Uh, I think the probably the major theme throughout the book is if there's a good and perfect God, why do we live in a messed up world, right? How could there be how could there be a world which is deficient and has evil in it? Um, that's, that's really the, the question of the book. And that's really what he's saying here is, yes, it's a created world, and therefore it's not according to, to God and his essence, but even in this world, it's messed up, right? It could have been, you could make a perfect, uh, what would be the, what would be the, um, you know, the, the marshal, the, the parable would be, you know, you, you could make a tricycle. You could make a perfect tricycle. Now, a tricycle is never going to be a racing bike. You know, so 
as a tricycle, it's perfect. Is it a racing bike? No, it's not. And a racing bike is better. Um, so God made this world. It's not according to his essence. So that was way beyond. It's, it's much lower than that. Everything is according to our level. So it's a tricycle, but it's not even a good tricycle. It's a messed up tricycle. The wheels are skew, right? There's evil deficiency in it. Um, so on the contrary, he restrained, as it were, his goodness and did not do what would have been appropriate according to this true goodness, to his true goodness, even on our level. Even though he chose to guide creations and reveal himself to them only according to their level, and not according to his own level, he could have at least revealed himself to them and guided them with a degree of perfection appropriate for their level and no deficiencies. And our author, uh, what's his name, Rabbi Rose, um, adds incorrectly here um, that, yeah, that, um, as in fact will ultimately happen after the final redemption. Meaning, when we talk about tikkun olam, the, the, the repair, the fixing of the world means, yes, there will be a stage in history when all of that is removed. Um, his intrinsic goodness and kindness should have dictated that he reveal himself to them with immense goodness and abundant creative power. Things could go really well in this world. We, we, we can envisage, envisage that. Envision, envisage. We can, right? We, we, we can have a vision of a perfect world. It's our world, but it's perfect. We're all healthy. We all look good. We all feel good. The food is great. The, right? There are no, um, all doctors are out of work, lie on beaches, drink um, Camparis, and photographers have never worked harder be than ever before because everyone is not sure it's going to last forever um so he should have dictated that he reveal himself to them with immense goodness and abundant creative power his perfection should have dictated that his actions be perfect without any deficiency it's a terrible thing that there's deficiency in god's world yet he held all this back and chose to act in an imperfect way Without the illumination of his divine light, this is the situation we find ourselves in today. However, he does not want to leave the world in such a state, constantly volatile and unstable because of the partnership of good and evil. Rather, his great goodness decreed that there should be a guiding force working on a deep level from within the system of good and evil, let's call it the system, the system of deficiency. The purpose of this guiding force is to bring the entire creation to the appropriate state of complete perfection, which, by the way, answers a, a question he dealt with differently earlier in the book. If you remember, he had the, the, the student asked at one stage and said, listen, if you know, God put us in a world of good and bad, of evil and tovara, evil and, and good and morality. Um, and we have the opportunity to, to earn our reward by attaching ourselves to the good and distancing ourselves from the bad. Why does that have to come to an end? What a great system. Like, yeah, people, you've been created. In fact, if you read a lot of the you know, we read another book of his, the 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 Derek Hashem. The the he he really kind of goes down that path of like, listen, what is life about? Life is an opportunity to attach yourself to the good and distance yourself from the bad through your own choices, and therefore you've created yourself, you've done the work, and heaven is all yours. And he asked, so what? Why does that have to end? Why do we find? And that's right at the beginning of the book, by the way. Why do we find that? There's so much in our, um, there's so much in Jewish thought and in prophecy about a world becoming mutukan, fixed, right? Where, where the lion will lie down with the lamb. And wh why do we need that? Right? So, what if that never happened? If, if the purpose of the world was that we should have a 
be in the balance and have to make these important choices and create ourselves as a world. So then the answer, the answer over here is, but God is perfect. That's a deficient, that's a deficiency which can only exist as a means to revealing something which is perfect. Meaning in this aspect, not in, not in every aspect of life, do we say the means justify, the, the, the end justifies the means. But this one for sure does right the end meaning the revelation of god being the only worthwhile only true force in the world the only um meaningful existence that needed to go through a process of um of of um Of, rev of revealing that there is of negation, that there are no other options, right? That uh, everything, all raw, evil, what it, it's just in a, it's an illusion. It's, there's an apparent good, but in the end we'll see, no, no, it's really terrible. There, there is no, nothing worthwhile that comes from. That justifies the deficiency of this world. The, let's call it the def the temporary deficiency of this world. It couldn't go on forever because God is perfect. And how could it be that God's creation remains imperfect? That, that's kind of a that's kind of a um, um, theological reason for this idea of tikkun olam that the world will become perfected. So. What's going on is that within this good and this world of deficiency, there is a force, a guiding force. God is guiding the world. Um, in his great goodness, decreed that there should be a guiding force working on a deep level from within the system of good and evil itself. The purpose of this guiding force is to bring the entire creation to the appropriate state of complete perfection. This dynamic, just by the way, I'm not, I can't remember if he says it in the book, but you could definitely hear, you know, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, right? Listen, Hashem is our God, the God of, of, of din, of justice, right? Decreeing good and bad and Hashem Echad. But eventually it's going to be that there's, a revelation no there's no nothing besides god is actually evil is destroyed and there's nothing to that so that's the and he calls that a deep a, a guiding force within the purpose of this guiding force is to bring the entire creation to appropriate state of complete perfection this dynamic this dynamic that is handiwork should inevitably be perfected and not remain deficient is a product of his perfection um However, this is not, now, remember, the question was, are we really relating to God's perfection? No. However, this is not a manifestation of the simple perfection of his unknowable essence. Don't go there. His simple essence has absolutely no connection with this world. Rather, as I explained, God's perfection dictates that even though he chooses to act upon the world only according to the level of his creations, his actions are perfect, even on that level, on this lower level, right? Uh, it's got to be a working, uh, a working tricycle. This truth, this truth is the source of that guiding force I mentioned, which operates on a deep level, directing the entire world to a state of total perfection. Okay, good. Any questions, insights? Good. Um, nonetheless, let's see what he says now. When he restrained, as it were, his attributes of compassion, as we mentioned above, this meant that he did not act according to his attribute of perfection and create perfect beings. Instead, he created me things, right? Initially imperfect, 
only in the end will they be perfect as a result of the guiding force that stems from the level of his great goodness, as I explained. Had he left the world to be governed only by the attribute of judgment, the world would never come to a state of, of would never overcome its state of imperfection. There would always be righteous and wicked people, good and evil, blessings and curses, which would be a problem, a, a theological impossibility, really. But now that he also uses his attribute of perfection, although there is imperfection in the beginning, it's temporary, it will not remain in the end. Therefore, while the attribute of judgment is evident, the attribute that causes universal perfection operates in a hidden way until all of existence will be perfected at the time of the final redemption. Okay, so I, that's uh, good stuff. Does the, does, does the Ramachal bring evidence of an increasing state of improvement and things getting better in the world moving towards this final state, or is that trajectory irrelevant? Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but it's not, it's not, um, what should I say? It, it's not linear. There's no, there are many ways to get there. So it's, it might get, you know, the, the um, traditions of a war of Gog and Magog and, you know, an Armageddon kind of looking like end is because the world gets so bad that kind of e the evil gets so dramatic and, and powerful that, you know, the end is this equally dramatic and powerful ending. He said before, you know, had even Adam, Adam and Eve, had Adam in the Garden of Eden overcome that temptation to attach himself to evil, right then would have been the, that would have been enough. Um, so yeah, it it doesn't, and I think a lot of this we'll we'll see in the book how, you know, this it might go up and down. Um, so okay, now that my question has been answered, the attribute that causes universal perfection is without a doubt a manifestation of his perfect goodness, but only insofar as he desires to act upon the world according to our limited level and not according to his own exalted level. Good. I would like to give a more detailed explanation of this subject. Okay, so, excuse me, I'll leave it to you guys to answer what, what's going to be more detailed. What's he adding here? It is certain that in all of God's dealings with us, we can discern two elements, the evident and the concealed. The evident is the reward or punishment decreed upon each person according to what he deserves, be it good or bad. Um, so that, you know, we'll, we'll deal with this more about how evident this really is, because sometimes we see the righteous suffer and the evil, the evil people good, but the basic revealed, um, system over here in the world is that good happens to good people, people that make good choices, good things happen to them. People that make bad, bad choices, bad things happen to them. And you know, if you think on that, if you just take that um, rule, it kind of is the overall rule of life, right? That's what we teach our children. Make good choices and your life will be better, right? Become educated, go get a job, even in the very physical. Take care of your physical, you know, eat healthily. Um, exercise, do what you make choices which are good, and you'll see good results come out of that. People who are bad, well, they make bad choices, and therefore bad happens to them. It is, right? There are a lot of exceptions. I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not dodging that, but I think, you know, it's, it's the exception rather than the rule when that doesn't work. Right? Good happens to people that make good choices and bad happens to people that make bad choices. That's, that's the way of the world. The concealed is the profound design that is constantly present in all of God's actions upon the world, which 
through which he brings the entire creation to a state of complete perfection. So there's this underlying force. This is the way God has structured um, the world, the inner, is that right? Yeah. Um, the inner purpose of every event, whether minor or major, is only to bring the world to a state of complete perfection. This is, as our sages said, everything God does is for the good. So, right, call Manda, Avadrachman and Latav. What do you mean everything's for the good? Some things are terrible. No, nothing ever happens that isn't, in some way, there's, there's an aspect of it. There's a guiding force within it towards the ultimate good. And once again, the, the end justifies the means. Somehow this will play a part in that ultimate good. And these are the words of the prophet. Your anger will be removed and you will comfort me. So eventually we'll see. You know, he's understanding that verse to mean that I will be comforted about the anger, not that your anger will stop. Um, this refers to the fact that at the time of the final redemption, God will make known to the Jewish people and in fact, the entire world, the real meaning of his ways. They will understand how even the chastisements and suffering they endured were only preparations for goodness that were an actual prelude to the granting of uh, blessing. And I think he means over here, even when the, um, even when the system of of good and bad, the system of justice could not explain it to us, right? So there, there's an aspect, you know, take the Holocaust, you know, it, it's very difficult to say this was just a, you know, a system of, of justice involved. Um, very good people, right? Sadiqim were, 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 were slaughtered, were, were, were gassed. How could that happen? So a true believer will say, yeah, of course it was terrible, but in the end, it's going to play its part as well. Um, and it's a prelude and it's a preparation for the ultimate goodness. God only wants his creations to be perfected, does not completely reject the wicked. On the contrary, he purifies them through the fire of suffering so that they will emerge cleansed from all cleansed of all their dross. Um, so he's bringing in. So it's, I, I find this. I'll tell you why. What my difficulty is, and I'm, I'm already have started to tell you how I'm trying to answer it. I am quite open to suggestions. If he's talking about the inner force. Um, the, the hidden force within every action, right? Which is everything God does is for good. And now he's talking about the suffering of the wicked. But the suffering of the wicked is the system of justice, right? It's, it's the, it's the, um, it's the, you know, God wants his creations to be perfected does not completely reject the wicked. On the contrary, he purifies them through the fire of suffering so that they will emerge cleansed of all their dross. Um, I all think he what? means- Dross? What? what are you saying, all their dross? The yeah, dross is like a, the impurities in a metal. The, the reason why you put uh, metals go through the kiln or whatever, the, the fire, um, the what's it called kivshin uh whatever um furnace um whatever yeah is to get rid of impurities so i think what he's saying over here is like this is that why you know god if people make bad choices why is it where does teshuva come from why, why is there a system of teshuva that 
people can um, be redeemed. They can redeem themselves. They can be redeemed from their evil, from their bad choices. And I think what he's saying over here is, is a bit of an overlap of the two systems, meaning that the, the um, force to fix this world, to, to get this world to be perfected, says that the wicked person that made their choice should be brought round, should be brought back to good. How do you bring a person back to good? Through suffering, right? Through punishment. That, that's, the idea. That, that's what God does. That's my understanding of, the, of, of what he's trying to say over here. I don't know if anything, anyone has a different understanding. Everything that he brings upon us, whether good or bad, has the same positive purpose as we have explained. I guess it means, I'm trying to put it all together, a, a person, we're in a world with good and bad possibilities, opportunities. A person does a sin, they make a bad choice, so they are met with bad, because that's what it means. There's a consequence to action. Yet, within that bad, within the, the pain, suffering that occurs, is actually something to fix the problem right it's not just it's not just the natural the natural or designed consequence but it's actually a me method of coming back to uh, fixing the the um the problem um I, I guess I'm trying to think of a, a parable here. Um, well, Rabbi, what's what's the determination as to whether or not the action is good or bad? I mean, if it's not its manifestation in this world as to whether or not it brings about a good outcome or a bad outcome, as we can judge, right? I mean, how is that to be determined? Say it again. I'm not sure of your question. Well, we're trying to decide between a good action and, and a bad action. So what constitutes a, a good action? Is it one that has a good outcome in the world? And then how are we to determine whether or not that outcome is good or not in our limited understanding of the world? Right? We're in our, our 10th grade class. We think what we did was good. Uh, what do we know? Um, I, I think I think there's enough understanding in this world that we can know most of the time. Right? But he gave us mitzvot. He gave us the Torah with its instructions as to what was good and bad. Why isn't that an answer? Well, because rules end up in conflict all of the time. No matter how many you have, no matter what axiomatic system, you're going to end up defining with, I mean, sure, there's some ruach and some intentionality, and we can certainly try to do what we think is the right and good thing. And is the intention then sufficient? It's not the intention, it's the act. If you act in accordance with the laws you're doing good by definition and let's say like to the way i'm understanding dan's question is okay so you decide to go and give charity but because you gave charity you can't afford a good dinner tonight right you you you, you have to go to or you can't take your wife out to a good dinner something right you're balancing one talking... good we took against about another good, bad, not good, then. Well, but okay, but you're balancing bad. you're balancing choices. You're always making right. a decision, and these things are not necessarily obvious as to which one you're going to weigh in which and what direction. 
to say that the Torah is the guide for everything and then that's it, we're, that's, I think, a little bit simplistic. And Well... It, is that it, a wrong thing to say to a rabbi, maybe? Yes. <laughs> to a rabbi. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's been nice <laughs> knowing you. Actually, on, speaking of bad and you know, incorrect right. decisions, right? <laughs> I think the answer is that the Torah is absolutely uh, the sum of all truth. And um, we, a person casually reading it may not be able to interpret everything that she or he is supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And that's why we have halacha. And halacha is the interpretation of the Torah, which is the most careful um, uh, interpretation that, uh, that great rabbis can, can give us. Uh, and so between the literal understanding of the Torah and between uh, the... Uh, uh, the psikah, the, the fatwas that the rabbis give us, that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, that, that defines good and bad. And, and there is a difference between, uh, between things done incorrectly on purpose versus things done incorrectly uh, by mistake. Beshogag and bezadon. Shogag is by mistake. Zadon is, you know, with intent of being bad. Um, and there's different ways to that as well. Right, Rabbi? Is that kind of a summary of Torah, Halacha, Shogag, and Zadon? Yeah, it is. I'm just, you know, it's interesting that he he hasn't really brought that into his book here, right? I know we are saying that. We, we think that way. Of course, I think that way. The, the definition of good is what the Torah tells us to do, and the definition of bad is what the Torah tells us to avoid. It's Torah actually comes from the word hurrah to, to guidance right it's the guidebook um i'm wondering why he hasn't why he hasn't really brought that in very well very much at all um and i'm also thinking about um you know there's a one of the i don't know if any of you have studied tanya um the great uh hasidic book right the chabad Bible, right? The, the first uh, first Hasidic Rebbe, the Bala, is known as the Baal Hatanya, the, the 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 author of the book called Tanya, and he he says that you know there are four types of people, and it's it's based on a Gemara that there's a you know tzaddik, we find tzaddik for tovlo, um, we find good people who have lead good lives, tzaddik veralo. We find good people that live bad lives, right? Not not bad morally, but bad physically, right? They, they have a hard times. Um, we have Russia Varalo and Russia Vatoivlo, right? The, the, the same thing, right? The evil person who's living the good life and the evil person that actually lives a bad life. So he says it 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 doesn't only mean um, like tzaddik veralo doesn't mean the tzaddik and a bad situation, but it means a tzaddik veralo. There's still raw in him, right? The, 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 he's a tzaddik. He acts in a very righteous way, but maybe his intentions are not very good. Maybe he's got past past misgivings, and therefore this would apply. What what you know, even though you would think, well, well, he should live a good life. He's doing the right thing. No, the, the, the pain and suffering in his life is to cleanse him from that dross, right? Um, so I think that I think on those lines, like the experience, do we experience it as good and bad? I, I'm not sure he means it in a moral sense over here. Um, it, it might be more, I'm thinking he's, he's thinking more on the experiential, um, the experiential level. And that in itself is complicated, right? Uh, as the Talmud says, no one ever does a sin without some benefit, right? There's always something in it. So there's, you know, might be a very short-lived, might, might be, um, 
you know, temporary pleasure, but there's something you no know, one people don't make sadistic choices on regularly. Well, there's um, also often often pain in doing the right thing. Exactly, and we're re we're rewarded for that, right? Lefum Sara Agra. The according to the pain is the reward. Um, so I think that he. I think he's speaking here more, not on the moral level, but on the experiential level. That's why, um, and the because the perfected world is is an experience experienced perfected world, right? It's the now, of course, it's related to the moral. Um, and I wonder if, in the end. Well, in the end, there is no evil. So, it, it, of course, they go together. Okay, I don't know, Dan, I, I don't know if I've done anything to answer your question, and I've definitely done a lot to confuse the rest of us. Perfect. <laughs> Good. That's just, just where we want to be. Okay, friends, we, you know, the Zoom is great, but it's very hard to have a scotch with your friends when you're on Zoom, right? Um, let's, uh, I would, I would have a big Lechaim right now because we need one. Okay. However, you must be aware that everything God does is awesome, all encompassing and of infinite depth. So now this is a very interesting paragraph. This is alluded to in the verse, how great are your deeds, O God, Marabu Masecha. Even the most insignificant of his actions contain a depth and breadth of wisdom that is absolutely beyond any human understanding. That is the meaning of the con continuation of the verse. Um, your thoughts are exceedingly profound. At the present time, God's actions are totally incomprehensible to us. We only see their surface meaning, while their true inner meaning remains hidden. So this is really an aspect of faith because we cannot see it, right? We cannot comprehend that. The proof of this is that the inner element of God's actions is exactly the same. They are all good without any negative aspect of all, right? Because the end justifies the means, and it's all working towards that glorious end, which is certainly not perceivable or understandable at the present time. However, when the final redemption comes, we will at least see and understand how everything that ever happened was part of God's profound plan to bestow good upon us in the end. When we come to know that, we know that aspect of God. But let us not imagine that because of this, we will grasp all the great wisdom that was involved in everything that God did. In fact, all that man will ever understand of God's actions is only like a drop in the vast ocean. Now that's a bit why, meaning if, if we have now the professor teaching 10th grade, why is he going to do things in 10th grade which the 10th graders don't get? There's, there's some sort of, uh, I don't understand the need for this. Somehow he knows it's true. I guess that's what the prophet is telling us. He's telling us, you know, my, God's actions are deep and, and, and hard to understand. Um, let's see if he clarifies it. Therefore, we should be aware that since God chose to act upon the world with the attribute of absolute good, which we mentioned, meaning the underlying force, everything that happens to us now is a result of the system of reward and punishment. That's the system of deficiency, right? That there's good and bad in this world and you can attach yourself to either, contains within it an inner level that certainly cannot be seen from the outside. On this level, God and his goodness is constantly directing and guiding us to our ultimate perfection. Some of this inner level will be revealed to us immediately at the time of the final redemption, as it says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Uh, this verse refers to our eyes being open to that part of God's design, which is recognizable from within the events of the world themselves. As soon as our eyes become 
illuminated with the true light of knowledge, we will understand that can be understood from within each event in history. Right? So I think what he's talking about here, and he has a note. So it, what is he talking about? He's talking about over here, the guy that's on his way to work and he gets a flat, you know, and he's got this huge meeting and it's his flat tire is just a disaster. And 20 minutes later, you know, he hears the news that the Twin Towers were bombed, right? And his meeting was on the top floor. So at the time, it seemed very bad. In the end, it's revealed as, wow, that was amazing, right? What a good thing happened to me. Um, so we will be able to understand part from within. That's what he means. From within the events of the world themselves, we'll see how they led to the final tikkun, this revelation of God's oneness. Um, however, we won't understand all of the chachma. We won't understand everything that's there to grasp. That might be left for the world to come. Right? There's another level of understanding of, of attachment of knowledge, which we'll get in the world to come. There, there, by the way, that last point is based on a footnote over here. Um, back on where was that footnote? Whatever. One of one of the footnotes. Um, oh, on the next page. Okay. Oh wait, I haven't turned my page here. What page are we on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, footnote 42. You can look at it. Um, however, there's certainly a great deal of profound wisdom in all the events that cannot be recognized, understood at all from within the events themselves. Because wisdom is so exalted and can only be grasped even, and is so exalted that it cannot be grasped even through his actions. So it's, you know, it's deriving the knowledge through the actions that goes to some level but then what really was god thinking right or what really was god doing we might need an explanation all right both of these the wisdom that can be known and the wisdom that cannot be known are product of god's absolute good which acts positively upon us nevertheless they're both relative to only to our limited level and do not relate to his infinite level as explained above the reason for this is that although they are derived from God's perfection, right, all his actions upon the world are only at a level suitable for us. Okay. Um, okay. So it looks like we need a summary. Any, maybe we should read that before we get into conversation, unless anyone has a burning question, issue, something you want to add. Okay, um, please summarize this as well. The general principle is as follows. God's own intrinsic perfection is totally unknowable. However, he wanted to implement his attribute of perfect goodness, although only according to our limited level and no more. Therefore, he set in place plans and methods of guidance in order to bring the entire creation to a state of completeness and perfection. This is the hidden aspect of all God's actions, that which they all have in common. So, whatever happens, it's all for the good. That's a very Jewish statement. Very true. It's all for the good. A tiny part of this hidden level will be revealed and understood from within the events yeah. of the world themselves. We'll see how they all come together. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched, um, I'm sure you've all watched um, either on TV or say, you know, artists that are very good at, you know, drawing different parts of an image and you don't know what they're drawing. And in the end, they like with one swoop, you know, they, they the whole thing comes together and you're like, wow, you know, I didn't realize that was a nose and those eye, whatever. We will see that, right? Um, but that's only a tiny part of the, um, the, wisdom and the 
the oneness of God that that exists there. Um, so a tiny part of this hidden level will be revealed and understood from within the events of the world themselves when God decides to open our eyes to this level of reality. However, for the most part, this level will remain elevated, exalted, totally beyond our understanding because of the great depth of God's wondrous wisdom. And according to the note, we will get to know that, but within the world to come. Um, now, it is important to know that only the hidden force of perfection relates directly to God and not the system of reward and punishment. Okay, let's try grasp this, okay? Meaning, um, in terms of our parable, right? So Einstein comes into to 10th grade to teach, um, to teach physics, and he give a very mumble a very bad class right the, the students don't understand it's it's not well organized but he einstein is doing it because he's got a plan right in in, in three classes time everything's going to come together and then the, the the students are going to understand why it was such a mess um now Um, while he's making a mess in those first few classes he's acting that's not true to himself at all right he, he's it, it appears like what's going on here where, where, where's Einstein today we've got some Nebuch teacher so he says like this it is important to know that only the hidden force of perfection relates directly to God. That Oh, that is God, because that's God leading the world to perfection and not the system of reward and punishment, the system that exists in the time of deficiency, because God, that's not God. This is because God is perfect and all his actions are perfect. Those things that result from the laws and attributes of the system of reward and punishment during the time of deficiency are considered as if they occur automatically according to what has previously been built into each individual attribute. So that's kind of God putting on the show. Okay, let's do something, not according to who I am and what I really want to do, but you know, we'll put on a show and then in the end, I'll bring that to something which really is fitting to for me. This happens because God has already arranged and set into place in place the laws and patterns of everything that will ever come into the world as a result of the system of reward and punishment. Um, nevertheless, for as long as the system of reward and punishment needs to operate, its actions are ultimately derived from the influence of the hidden force of, per of perfection itself. This is because God's perfection is the source of everything even those things that are caused um let me finish this yes 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 good that are caused by the system of reward and punishment uh, are all part of a continuous process leading the world to perfection we're in good hands however as long as god's oneness is hidden things must follow this pattern i.e. on the visible level, good and evil, on the deeper level, the force of perfection. Therefore, it is the influence of the force of perfection itself upon the system of reward and punishment that causes all these actions to emerge by themselves. This is because God chose in his great wisdom that these actions should emerge from the source of perfection itself while his oneness is concealed. In the end, the outcome of the influence of the force of perfection will be that the entire system governing the world will relate directly to God. So I guess it's right now we cannot perceive how the system of reward and punishment, the system of a world of deficiency, really relates to God. It's a deficient world. It doesn't fit. In the end, when we see what it, what it leads to, and the, the, the oneness of God that it leads to. So uh, there's a great word in Hebrew, lemafreya, right? Retroactively, 
we'll see how the system right now also relates directly to God. Oh, Einstein, you're so clever that even your mess is, a cle is, is brilliant, right? Um, that's what we're going to see. So this phenomenon is a third aspect that can be discerned in all of God's attributes, namely the production of what is inherent in each attribute through the influence of the force of perfection itself upon it. This is something intermediate between God's perfection and the particular attribute. So meaning it's, it's deficient now, but it has within it the ability to become perfect. Um, it has a different form in each attribute, depending on the particular nature of that attribute. Um, you know, talk about, you know, whatever. You know, the, you want to talk about the health in the world. Well, that's one attribute of God. You know, God is a very unhealthy world right now. You want to talk about beauty. Yeah, it's beautiful, but there's, you know, things are chipped. Well, all these attributes, they all have within them that eventually they will be led to the state when they are revealed as perfect. This is because the structure of each attribute dictates how the force of perfection interrelates with, with it. Um, yeah. And, uh, quite sure what he wants with that. We need to define this intermediary level, both in terms of what it actually is and in terms of how it functions, as we will explain later. Um, okay, so we'll see in the note, he doesn't know where that later is in the book, but that's our job to find it and write to him. All right, gentlemen, um, that completes chapter three, part four. Um, good. Questions, comments, insights. What does this explain to you? When they found what he wrote, this book, how did he write? He wrote it all in Hebrew, like by hand. What in like the the early? Yeah. How long ago? Uh, he lived. The early 1600s, I think. So it's 1700s. Was it 1700s? Yeah, maybe. 17s. Yeah. So there was a printing press. Uh, it, it, right. might, it might have been uh, printed in his lifetime. Um, 2016. Oh, he's, he's, he's like our age. Hmm. First edition, no? Yeah. I don't know. It's... Um. Does, did he have that in the introduction over here? I wonder if it was an original, uh, or do you know that you know the way thing, things have been preserved, or if? Uh, well, it's a, somehow we know the book was completed in 1734 during his life. Hmm. Sorry, Lev. What are you? I'm not, I'm just, you know, uh, just thinking about the, the actual time when it was created, when all of this came out, like you said, 17, 34, he died 10 years later. And do you remember where he's he, he where in uh he was from where he, he was living from Italy. He, he was living uh, Padua. In Italy, right. Mm -hmm. Um he moved to he moved to Amsterdam in uh, 35. Israel outside of Haifa, which is where he passed away. He moved from Amsterdam to uh Palestine, or whatever it was called, then I guess it was right in '43. Wow! I like the idea that you shared of 
comparing that whole description with you know Einstein making a presentation, making a mess, and it looks like a big polygon. And then later on, you're like, oh, you know, it was brilliant, but it seems so um, difficult to imagine like some of the pain and the suffering and the stuff that goes on or that has gone on that it um, makes sense now or that it could make sense later. Right. I mean, I guess right. we just have to get to later. It is, but it's, um, I, I find it fascinating. It's a, it's a brilliant um, effort to try explain this major problem, right? There's a good and perfect God and this world ain't like that. It feels a bit like some of the philosophy that was around at the time, like Descartes and Spinoza, where you're trying to apply logical reasoning to explications of divinity and God's role in the world and to some degree. And when we finish with the book, you'll have to give us a whole class to, to devoted wow. to that with specific examples, please. Well done, Don. I'll see what I can do. Yep. More work. No pressure. Was this when Bayes did his stuff too, or is that a little later? I'm going to have to Google that to figure that out. <laughs> like I do when I have to figure out what Bayes' theorem is, because it's either <laughs> The B before the A, or <laughs> all right, gentlemen. Have a fantastic week. Thank you. I I, I enjoy this a lot. Um, and look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. We'll we'll not be here uh, next next Tuesday, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, we'll, uh, we'll enjoy the recording. So okay. we'll miss you. Bye. A happy late 75th, Uri. We, uh, well, thank you, thank you. Really uh, very good for 75. We're impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I give us all a bracha. We should look like Uri at 75. The Ram Paul that keeps, it's a Ram Paul that keeps me going. Well, there you go. It's the, the hidden force. <laughs> yeah. I think it's those great children of yours. <laughs> no, the country. They've dragged me down, dragged me down. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I tried, Gil. I tried once That's again. Good. Thank you. That's all right. It, there's always therapy. But, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> chipping away at the old block. <laughs> Take care, guys. Okay. Bye. God bless. Bye. Bye. All right. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. Night. Okay, Uri. Thank. Oh, Lev. Hey. Okay, dude. This is all <laughs> from from you saying, "Hey, let's do something cabalistic." Yeah. It's a. It's. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it really it's is. Such right? a miracle, you know, that we're sitting here learning this stuff. I know. It also, I pinch myself. Yeah. Yeah. How I, you mean, I, I went over. I tried to go over some of it. 